AP Biology, Chapter 48, The Nervous System, Part 2. In this part, we're also going to talk about Chapter 49 and how a sarcomere, the unit of muscle contraction, works as well. Action Potential Graph. Remember that the neuron at rest is minus 70 millivolts, has more negative inside the cell, inside the neuron, than it is outside. Once sodium uh, enters that neuron, it's going to reach a threshold potential, which is the minimum amount of uh, sodium to fire the neuron. Once it's fired, it's going to completely uh, transmit and open up these protein channels all the way down the line until it reaches the end to the synapse. Once we reach the threshold potential, the next step is the action potential that's triggered. The action potential is uh, synonymous with the nerve impulse, so they mean kind of the same or they're very similar. Sodium channels open up in the nerve impulse or action potential, so we have sodium entering the axon uh, as well as the dendrites in the, the cell body. And what's going to happen is we're going to have a buildup of charges inside the, um, the neuron. As the uh, inside becomes more positive, we have a depolarization of that um, neuron, and eventually it becomes slightly positive. Then, after the sodium enters, transmitting the uh, impulse down the line like a wave, opening up new sodium channels, the sodium channels will close, and then the potassium channels open up. Potassium will leave the axon, and as the positively charged potassium leaves the axon, the charges inside the neuron become less and less positive until they become negative again. So now we've restored the charges, but we haven't restored the sodium and potassium. We have a little bit of an undershoot here uh, as a result of these uh, potassium channels opening up and more potassium uh, leaving than is required. And then we have something called the sodium-potassium pump. The sodium-potassium uh, pump is going to pump out sodium and pump in potassium to reset that uh, neuron for the next uh, action potential. And then we're back at minus 70 millivolts and we're ready to fire another nerve impulse down the line. All right, so that was the basic uh, explanation of how uh, neurons transmit a action potential or nerve impulse. However, there are some things that you should also know, and this is one of them. We're going to need to write this down. And around the outside of the axon here, we have this insulated sheath called the myelin sheath made up of something called Schwann cells. So here we have the myelin sheath made up of Schwann cells, and they're going to insulate the axon. Now, what happens as a result of that is something called saltatory conduction, and you need to know about this. Saltatory conduction increases the speed of the nerve impulse as the signal hops from node to node. So we still have uh, potassium channels opening and sodium channels opening. However, the impulse itself is going to jump over these myelin sheath areas, or the, uh, the Schwann cells, and uh, be conducted even faster. So we're talking about going 150 meters per second versus 5 meters per second without the myelin sheath. So this will greatly increase transmission of uh, the signal. Here we have another picture. We have the Schwann cell. It looks kind of like a uh, fruit roll-up or something. We got the nucleus there. We got the axon, and then the uh, signal jumps from uh, node of Ronvier to node of Ronvier. And that's one more thing you should know about. Node of Ronvier, saltatory conduction, increases speed of nerve impulse as the impulse jumps from node to node over the Schwann cells. And that's what you need to know about that. Things like multiple sclerosis affect the myelin sheath, so it slows down the, uh, the transmission speed, and loss of signal results in loss of control uh, from the brain, controlling the rest of the body. What happens at the end of the axon? Well, we have to go to a new um, neuron in many cases, and there's a gap between those two neurons. We have to jump that gap. The gap between two neurons is called a synapse, and you do need to know that. Let's write that down. Synapse is a gap between two neurons. It'll be the dendrite of the receiving neuron and the axon of the sending neuron. So here we have the axon sending down the nerve impulse. Now we've got to jump that gap to the dendrite of a receiving neuron. So how do we jump that gap? The answer is neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are stored in vesicles, and we're going to go through this step by step. The basic uh, explanation, however, is we have a diffusion, high to low concentration, of chemicals across the synapse right here. And those green things are the neurotransmitters. And we're going to trigger another nerve impulse in the next um, neuron. This uh, 
other neuron has stimulus for receptors on the dendrites, so they can receive um, some of these neurotransmitter chemicals and open up protein channels that we're going to talk about now. Don't have to really write this down because we're going to go through this in uh, a little bit more detail right now. And here are all the steps, and you do need to know the steps. The first step is once that nerve impulse, remember sodium channels opening after that potassium channels, restoring the, uh, the resting potential, the minus 70 millivolts, the nerve impulse is going to trigger at the end of the axon a calcium channel. And this calcium channel is going to open up, many calcium channels, and these calcium um, ions will trigger the release of the neurotransmitters. So step one, calcium results in a release of neurotransmitters as a result of the nerve impulse reaching the end of the axon. Step two, the neurotransmitters are going to be released by exocytosis across this very small synapse and diffuse across the synapse to the next neuron. Then the third step is we are going to have these neurotransmitters doing a shape change to the protein channel and that shape change is going to allow sodium to enter the next neuron. Once the sodium enters the next neuron, it, enough of that sodium is going to reach a threshold potential which eventually triggers the action potential which triggers another impulse. And now we've uh, transmitted the signal from one neuron to the next one. So let's review that one more time. Step one, nerve impulse travels down the axon. Step two, calcium channels open up as a response to that nerve impulse. Step three, the calcium triggers the release of neurotransmitter at the end of the axon. Step four, neurotransmitters diffuse across the synapse. Step five, neurotransmitters bind with sodium protein channels on the next neuron, the dendrites, right over here. Step uh, six, we have protein channels now open to sodium. Sodium rushes in, causes the new threshold potential to be reached, which triggers the next nerve impulse and carries the signal down to the next uh, neuron, if that's available, or to a muscle it might activate. All right, so those are the steps in um, how a synapse works. Go ahead and review that a few times and make sure you understand how synapses and the transmission of nerve impulse from one neuron to another happens. All right, nerve impulse in the next neuron. So now that we have enough sodium here, the sodium diffuses into the cell. We've uh, started our nerve impulse again, going to be sent down the line just like before. These are called ion gated channels. Sodium is an ion, so it is uh, only going to be uh, working for sodium. Here are some uh, neurotransmitters. You don't have to know any details about uh, all these. However, we're going to focus on a couple of those. Acetylcholine is one that you definitely have to know. This is one that's um, transmitted at the end of a motor neuron to a muscle cell. So when you flex your muscles, you send a signal down to your brain from neuron to neuron, crossing the synapse. However, once that neuron reaches the muscle, it releases acetylcholine, which is going to trigger a muscle contraction, and we'll talk more about that later. The other neurotransmitters that I want you to know are epinephrine, also called adrenaline, released from your adrenal glands part of your fast response to stress, and norepinephrine, which has very similar effects. We're going to also talk about fight-or-flight responses, but the essence of a fight-or-flight response is speeding up your heart rate to get blood to all your cells faster, to provide glucose and other goodies that are going to need for a uh, stress situation. Also, um, breathing rate increases and some other things that we'll talk about. Dopamine is widespread in the brain. It affects sleep, mood, attention, and learning. So if you have low dopamine levels, all these things are affected. And a lack of dopamine is involved with Parkinson's disease, which uh, causes shaking. It's a, a disease result of lack of this neurotransmitter. And excessive dopamine can lead to schizophrenia, which is not the same thing as multiple personality disorder. That's more of a general not being aware of your surrounding reality. And uh, it's a little bit different from uh, multiple personality disorder. Serotonin is uh, another important one. It's widespread in the brain and affects things like sleep, mood, attention, and learning as well, like dopamine. So S and D, dopamine, serotonin. Hmm. If you don't get enough dopamine, you feel dopey or sleepy. I don't know. Try to figure out a way to remember that dopamine and serotonin affect sleep, mood, attention, and learning. Epinephrine, also called adrenaline, that's an easy one, fight or flight response. Acetylcholine, you're going to have to remember that. That's muscle contraction. 
All right, neurotransmitters are the weak point in the nervous system. You have to cross a gap. So a lot of things that affect that gap uh, will dramatically affect the nervous system. Things like nitric uh, oxide, carbon monoxide, uh, stimulants, amphetamines, caffeine, nicotine, depressants, all these things have an effect on uh, the neurotransmitters. Things like uh, sarin gas, which is a uh, chemical weapon, uh, basically shuts down the neurotransmitter or blocks the neurotransmitters, and you can't conduct nerve impulses from your brain to the rest of your body, and that's not good if you need to send signals from your medulla to your lungs to breathe. Now remember, you need acetylcholine in order to trigger muscle contraction, and you have an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, which breaks down that neurotransmitter so it's um, uh, recyclable. What ends up happening is for the enzyme that you have in your body called acetylcholinesterase, you have an active site. And remember, that has the uh, place of attachment for something like acetylcholine in order to break it down. Now, for a snake venom, they have poisons, protein poisons, that block that active site. And here we have competitive inhibition, which causes a uh, blocking of that site. And now acetylcholine can't block. Uh, bind to the active site because of the snake venom. And if you can't do uh, make any more acetylcholine, if you can't break that down, your muscles can't uh, contract, and uh, you're basically paralyzed. So that's how the snake paralyzes its mouse prey. All right, a simple nerve uh, circuit. Let's uh, talk about that really quick. Now, some of the things you should know, uh, and you do want to write this down, motor neurons connect to a muscle. So think of it as like a motor of a car that's going to move you around. The neurons attached to a muscle that triggers the muscle contract is called a motor neuron. And here we have it located here in red. We have a sensory neuron, or sensory neurons. They receive information, for example, sense of touch, located in uh, blue here, and uh, in the back of your eye, other places what, which uh, receive information from the external environment are sensory neurons. And inter means between. Uh, interneurons connect neuron to neuron. So there's an uh, interneuron right here in the spinal cord that's connecting one neuron to another. And as you can see, we got the little gaps there. Those are the synapses that have to be crossed with neurotransmitters. All right, so let's talk about a simple nerve circuit. What we have here is, let's say we hit our leg. That leg uh, hit with the mallet is going to be detected by a sensory neuron. Sensory neuron conducts an impulse, remember, action potential, sends it right to the spinal cord, doesn't even go to the brain. This is to check for spinal cord um, function, more so than brain function. It's a faster route when that doctor is hitting your leg. Then the impulse is conducted across an inner neuron or directly to a motor neuron, uh, motor neuron, and then the conducted signal is taken to the motor neuron, and then if you remember, the neurotransmitter going to be released at the end of this motor neuron is called acetylcholine if it stimulates a muscle. The muscle is stimulated to contract, that we'll talk about later, and then you kick your leg, telling the doctor that your spinal cord is working okay. All right, let's talk a little bit about the human brain. Um, the three main parts of the brain are the cerebral uh, cerebrum, right here, where you're going to do most of your deep thinking and uh, visual uh, sound processing. Remember the hypothalamus and pituitary is inside the uh, cerebrum. Then you also have the cerebellum located right here. The cerebellum is involved mainly with balance and coordination, and that's about all you have to know about that. And then we have the medulla oblongata, which is part of your brain stem, and that's going to be in charge of some basic functions like breathing and heart rate. So once again, cerebrum involved with any kind of deep thinking in the front, as well as sensory data collection and processing. The cerebellum, longer word than cerebrum, involved with balance and coordination. And then we have the brainstem, the medulla, that is involved mainly with um, autonomic controls, like breathing and heart rate. Now the cerebrum is a fairly uh, complicated structure that came after some of the more basic structures that we find in birds and uh, even reptiles as far as um, brain activity. We have brain stems, brain stems, cerebellums, hypothalamus, uh, very old structures of the brain that are involved with uh, just basic life processes and uh, mainly autonomic or automatic processes like breathing and heart rate. All right, the brain stem includes the medulla. That's probably the most important part. If you remember, that uh, is going to increase your breathing rate as a result of carbon dioxide levels going up, lowering the pH of the blood. Functions of the brain stem are homeostasis, maintaining a st steady state environment, coordination of movement, uh, 
and conducting impulses to the higher brain centers, especially that cerebellum is coordination of uh, movement as well as balance and balance. Medulla involved with breathing, heart. Uh, you don't have to know all these, but make sure you know breathing and heart uh, rates are controlled by the medulla. We can use something called an EEG to record the electrical activity of the brain. Uh, don't get that confused with an EKG. An EKG is the heart uh, graph, which shows the uh, contraction, electrical impulses, contracting the atria and the ventricles. And it has that beep, 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 you know, thing that you see in the doctors. That's an EKG. An EEG is an electroencephalogram, and that's uh, involved with just detecting brain activities. And there's different types of brain activities determined by the different parts of consciousness during the day. So like things like rapid eye movement during uh, sleep time will have different brain wave patterns, like delta waves, than when you're awake. Cerebrum, uh, that's the most highly evolved structure in our brain, probably the most incredible thing in nature, in my opinion. We have uh, two things, uh, two sides of the brain. They're called hemispheres. The left side controls the right side of the body, and the right side controls the left side of the body. So whenever there's a stroke or damage to the brain as a result of clogged arteries or aneurysm or whatever, what will happen is um, if the left side is damaged, the right side is affected, and that left right side will become uh, unresponsive, and that side of the face might droop if the other side of the brain is uh, damaged. The corpus callosum connects those two sides together. Turns out females have a more developed uh, corpus callosum than males typically, so they must have better communication between the two sides of the brain. All right, what do the left and right hemispheres of the brain do? You don't have to know all this, but left hemisphere is mainly involved with linear processing, like step one, step two, step three, logic operations, math. If you're good at math, that might be the left hemisphere of your brain. The right hemisphere is more involved with pattern recognition, spatial relationships, like one thing, uh, where it is in relationship to another thing, nonverbal ideation, so thinking without words, emotional processing, uh, and parallel processing, like holistic thinking. If you do a concept mapping class, you're probably using a lot of right hemisphere. If you're learning a step-by-step -step procedure, like how a neuron transmits a nerve impulse, that's more left hemisphere. One interesting side note is if you do damage one side of your brain, the other side will take up some of the slack uh, to try to compensate. So we have some uh, specialization here, and you're not responsible for knowing all these, but we'll just go through it very quickly. We have a frontal lobe here. We have, uh, and this is where speech, uh, higher level thinking happens in the frontal lobe. When uh, people used to go crazy back in the old days, uh, violently crazy, they used to give them a lobotomy where they stuck an ice pick up their nose and scrambled this part, and that was called a lobotomy. They would be calm, but they wouldn't have the ability to uh, do deep processing or any... Um, any deep thoughts, so they turned into kind of a vegetable. There's a joke that goes, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Then we have the temporal lobe. That's uh, going to be on the sides near your ears, and it's also involved with hearing. The occipital is toward the uh, back of the brain, and that's involved with vision. So the eyes are here. The nerves have to go all the way back here in order to process it. And also, it has to be flipped over right side up as well. And then the parietal lobe is on the top. It's involved with things like speech also. Uh, taste, reading, some other stuff. This is kind of interesting. The amygdala is involved with emotional content of facial expressions. So if you, um, you know, see a scary movie or something, the amygdala is the fear processing center of your brain. And that's, uh, that's why you feel afraid, is the amygdala. Basic uh, description of the eye. The first uh, thing that we have here is the cornea. It's a clear uh, protein coat. And then um, that's just protection. Then we have something called the uh, aqueous humor. That's going to be a uh, liquid-filled area. Then we have the uh, iris. It gives you the color of the eyes, green, brown, whatever. Then we have the lens, which uh, have muscles, ciliary muscles attached to it that will be pulled. There's the muscle. There's the ligament. As you pull them, that's how you focus your vision. Then the light passes through, kind of flips the image over. We have sensory neurons on the back of the eye arranged in our retina. The retina is where we actually capture the light. Now, there's one place where we don't have any retinal cells, right here, and that's the blind spot. However, your brain is constantly um, 
kind of putting together a, a picture for yourself so you don't usually see the blind spot unless you're going to the doctor and they can uh, make you see it. The uh, retina is composed of two types of cells which are called rods and cones. The rods are the type of retinal cell that detects black and white and the cones detect the type of um, light that's in color. So as you can imagine a dog, if we thought it saw it in black and white, wouldn't have too many cones to see color in the back of its eye. Things like birds have a very dense packing of uh, rods and cones in the back of their eye and that's what gives them a better, uh, one of the reasons that gives them a better visual acuity than we have. The shape of your eyeball will determine the shape of the image on the back. So if you have a squished eyeball or a longer eyeball, you'll be nearsighted or farsighted as a result of that squishing of the eyeball. And then you have to wear glasses to correct the uh, distorted image on the back of your retina. All right, this is something you're going to need to know. The nervous system is composed of two parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now, the central nervous system is fairly straightforward. The central nervous system consists of only two things, and you could uh, write that underneath if you'd like, the brain and spinal cord. So the brain spinal cord is the CNS, or central nervous system. All the other neurons, all the other nerves in your body, make up the peripheral nervous system, which are divided into two parts. The peripheral nervous system is divided into the automatic, also called the autonomic, the actual word is autonomic, nervous system, and the somatic nervous system. Somatic means that it's under your control. So if the somatic nervous system is under your control, it's voluntary, we're talking about controlling muscle cells. So we can write that in there. Motor cell um, neurons attached to muscles, voluntary, under your control. So those are the neurons attached to your like biceps and things like that. Autonomic nervous system, or automatic nervous system, if you want to think of it that way, is divided into two parts. The parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system that we're going to talk about now. All right, so what does the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system do? Well, the first thing you have to know that they're both uh, subdivisions under the autonomic nervous system, which is also a subdivision under the peripheral nervous system, nervous system the parts of your nerves not involved with your brain or spinal cord, which is a part of your nervous system in general. Functional unit, of course, is the neuron. So think of sympathetic as sympathy toward you if you're attacked by a bear. So what would your body do if it was sympathizing or if it was nice to you if you were attacked by a bear? Well, the first thing it might do is dilate your pupils, get more light in there, especially this, though, accelerating the heartbeat to move that glucose and oxygen around to the cells of your body so you can do more uh, activity is super important if you're going to be attacked by a bear, and that's going to sympathize with your need to survive. You're also going to dilate the bronchi to get more oxygen into your lungs. That's going to definitely be a survival advantage. Uh, you're going to inhibit or slow down any digestive processes, and that's going to be uh, put on hold until the fight-or-flight uh, situation is over. You're going to be converting glycogen to glucose, raise your sugar levels in your blood in order to uh, uh, prepare for more activity. You're going to be in the fast uh, stress response. You're sending a nerve impulse down to your adrenal medulla, to secrete adrenaline and noradrenaline to also uh, help with some of this stuff, stimulate more heartbeats. And then we have bladder contraction inhibited. So you're not going to be uh, uh, using your bladder when you're fighting off that bear. So these are some of the things about the sympathetic nervous system. Now, let's say that you're out of danger and your body's relaxed. Now your parasympathetic nervous system kicks in stimulates uh, flow of saliva, so, you know, if you're eating and things like that, it'll, the enzymes in there will break down the starch. Think of this as like when you're eating. It slows your heartbeat, relax, constricts bronchi, less air getting in. We're going to have peristalsis and digestion going on, secretion of those enzymes from the pancreas into the duodenum of the small intestine, release of bile and storage of bile in the gallbladder. We're breaking down any fats using lipase, lipases after emulsifying the fats with bile contracts bladder, that's going to uh, you know, be easier to go to the restroom, I guess. So parasympathetic, sympathetic. Your sympathetic nervous system kicks in when you give a speech. So if you feel your heart rate going faster, you're in a fight or flight uh, situation, even though there's no actual danger to you. So it's kind of like a, a misdirection of some of these primitive um, systems that we have. All right, the only thing I want to talk about with this uh, skeleton is we have two skeletons here. We got the 
axial skeleton, or one skeleton divided into two parts. The axial skeleton, just like the central nervous system, is just the, the midline stuff. The skull, the spinal cord, the ribs, and that's pretty much it. Axial. The appendicular skeleton is any of the skeleton parts that are not part of the spinal cord, rib cage, and skull. A couple types of joints we have for our bones are the pivot joints. Here we have our neck, which is a pivot joint. You can kind of see how it kind of rotates in a, uh, a circle. Things like owls can really pivot that joint, so the head almost turns completely around. However, they can't turn it 360 degrees. They'd snap their neck. Ball and socket joint, that's the kind of joint we have in our uh, hips as well as our, uh, our arms up here. Remember, both your arms are modified front legs, and they have the same kind of structures as your, your lower legs. We have a hinge joint, which is uh, found in your elbows and knees, which is kind of like the hinge of a, of a, a door. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about with this uh, chapter, and this is chapter 49 stuff, and here's some things you have to know about muscles. Now, muscles only do one thing. They only contract. So the bicep only pulls the radius and ulna this way. The triceps only pull the arm the other way. Now, a lot of muscle pairs work, in, uh, work antagonistically with each other. So the bicep works antagonistically of the triceps. So we have contraction one way, contraction the other way. Same thing with like your chest. The chest muscles will contract your arms toward uh, your body and your back muscles pull your arms away from the body like in a rowing exercise. Now the functional unit that you need to know about in a muscle is called a sarcomere and we're definitely going to want to know that. Functional unit of muscle, sarcomere. The sarcomere has a couple things going on inside. We have two main types of proteins that you should know. We have the actin and myosin and we have a uh, sliding filament uh, theory on how these muscles work. So the thin filaments are called actin and the way I remember that is if you're active, you might be thinner. We also have thick filaments called myosin. If you eat sinfully delicious chocolate uh, sundaes all the time, you might get thicker. So that's one way to help you remember that. So first thing you should know, thin filament, actin, thick filament, myosin. The Z-line just separates one sarcomere from another sarcomere. And as the muscle contracts, it actually kind of bulges up a little bit as these proteins overlap each other. And this whole thing here is called a sarcomere. Remember the functional unit of the kidney was the nephron. Functional unit of the lung was the alveoli. We had, um, so those kind of things, uh, make sure you know. Neurons are the functional unit of the nervous system. All right, so we're going to get a little more detail now. We have the thick filament, the myosin, which has a little head on it. And this head has a lot of energy. It's, uh, it's going to get energy. It's going to be placed in position using energy from ATP. And it's going to be attached to the... Um, actin. Now, as the uh, muscle contracts, this head is going to move to the left here. So it's going to actually kind of go this way to the left and it's going to drag the actin uh, protein with it, contracting the muscle. So now we've got some more details and this gets a little more complicated and this is where we're going to end at. So step one and step two, motor neurons secrete acetylcholine from neurotransmitters to the muscle cell, causes the release of calcium. Take a look here. We have the axon of a motor neuron releasing acetylcholine, which is going to trigger the release of calcium, step one and two. Then we have calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, a type of muscle ER, will bind to troponin, which is going to be a blocking protein, that causes it to move away from the actin and myosin proteins, which must slide past each other during muscle contraction, and were blocked by troponin. So what ends up happening here is we have calcium binding to troponin, troponin releasing the actin, freeing up the actin and myosin to slide past each other. The next step is myosin, the thick filaments, are going to be in a high energy position from the previous muscle contraction, we'll talk about that in a minute, and um, are now going to pull the actin, now that the is released, contracting the sarcomere. So what we have here is the head here being uh, pulled in this direction, or it's going to uh, move in this direction, which is going to contract the muscle. The calcium then gets released. ATP will bind to the myosin, releasing the phosphate and using the energy, causing a shape change, which resets that uh, myosin for the next contraction. Troponin is now going to block the actin, preventing a muscle contraction until another nerve impulse. So here we have the uh, ATP broken down in ADP and phosphate, which is going to make a shape change, which is going to re-release this uh, myosin to reattach back to the actin. And now it's got like stored energy for another um, uh, release 
of the troponin to contract the muscle as a result of calcium, as a result of acetylcholine. All right, this ends uh, your part uh, two of chapter 48, and this also has some ch uh, chapter 49 stuff in there. Go ahead and review this uh, several times. This is uh, fairly complicated, and if you have questions, make sure you ask in class. This ends your content for AP Biology, and these are all the things that we covered uh, for the year.